All right, Lamentations. Um, you're going to hear on the video we watch in a few minutes, you're going to hear the, the folks in the video say that it's un, the unknown. Or you're going to hear me say that Jeremiah, in all likelihood, is the author of Lamentations. And so we have Jeremiah. We looked last week at the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. Uh, it was kind of looking forward to it, then you experience the, the reality of it, the midst of it. Lamentations is looking back at that. Just I mean, it's right, it's right there happening, 586, but it kind of looks back upon the tragedy of, uh, of the fall of Jerusalem. I'm going to ask you to find in your Bibles uh, Lamentations 2, uh, 5 and 6. Remember Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. And chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. We'll be reading these sort of as a, as a snapshot, a summary of the book itself. And I think you're going to find uh, this somewhat intriguing. It'll probably be a little shorter tonight because there's the, the scope of the book is, is not that, that large. But there's some great material in this. Stand with me if you would, if you found that. And if not, we've got it on the screen for you to, to be able to gaze upon the word as we read the word you follow along. The Lord has come, has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid in ruins its strongholds. And he has multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He has laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. Notice the, this is the perspective. Although the Babylonians did this, the prophet is saying, look what the Lord has done. He understands he's retraced the source back. In Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so this idea of the hope of mercy in the midst of judgment. We've just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And we want to be taught tonight from it to see Jesus in it. Thank you. You can be seated. I want to read again. We haven't read it in a while. Just to remind you that what is the, the overarching verse or two verses that are driving this study are Jesus' comments in John chapter 5, verses 39 to 40, where he's chiding the religious leaders. He said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. By, in other words, by, by knowing them well enough that that would be the way to have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. That's his challenge to them. Experts in the scriptures, they were, they were peerless. In order to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize the Old Testament, what you now understand to be the Old Testament. And do some other things, but I mean, Jesus said, you're completely missing the scriptures. They testify of me. Okay, with that in mind, let's watch the uh, video. It's a little briefer video, about seven, seven and a half minutes from the Bible Project of the book of Lamentations. The Book of Lamentations, it's a unique book in the Old Testament that contains five poems from an anonymous author who survived and is now reflecting back on the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem and the destruction and the exile that followed. Remember the whole story from the Book of Second Kings. The fall of Jerusalem and the exile was the most horrendous catastrophe in Israel's history up to this point. So remember, God had promised Abraham the land. He'd given David victory to make Jerusalem Israel's capital. And from David came the royal 
royal line of kings. You had God's presence there in the temple, and that's where the priests maintained the rituals of Israel's worship. And after 500 years of all of this history, in the summer of 587 BC, the city fell to Babylon. It was all decimated and gone. And so the book of Lamentations is a memorial to the pain and confusion of the Israelites that followed this destruction. Now the lament poems found here are not unique in the Bible. There's lots of them in the book of Psalms. And these biblical poems of lament, they do a number of things. They're a form of protest. They're a way of drawing everybody's attention, including God's attention, to the horrible things that happen in this world that should not be tolerated. They're a way of processing emotion. So in these poems, God's people vent their anger and dismay at the ruin caused by people's sin and selfishness. And these poems are a place to voice confusion. Suffering makes us ask questions about God's character and promises, and none of this is looked down on in the Bible. Just the opposite. These poems of lament give a sacred dignity to human suffering. And so these human words of grief that are addressed to God have now become part of God's word to his people. The design of these five poems is very intentional. It's part of the book's message. So chapters one through four are called acrostics, which means alphabet poems. Each poetic verse begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is made up of 22 letters. Now this very ordered and linear structure, it's in stark contrast to the disorder of the pain and the confused grief that's explored in these poems. So it's like Israel's suffering is explored A to Z and is trying to express something that is inexpressible. Chapters one and two each have one verse per letter, giving them a really similar design, but the themes are very different. So chapter one focuses on the grief and shame of a figure called Lady Zion. The poet personifies the city of Jerusalem as a widow, also called the daughter of Zion. And she sits alone. She's bereaved of her loved ones, devastated. No one comes to comfort her. It's a very powerful metaphor. And then Lady Zion speaks. She calls on the Lord to notice her fate. And through this image, the poet, he's showing that the city's destruction brought a level of psychological trauma on the Israelites that can only be expressed as the experience of a funeral and the death of a loved one. Chapter 2 focuses on the fall of Jerusalem and how it was a consequence of Israel's sin and was brought about by God's wrath, which is a key word in this poem. Now, it's important to remember that in the Bible, God's wrath is not spontaneous, volatile anger. The biblical poets and prophets, they use this word to talk about God's justice. So Israel had entered a covenant agreement with God, and for centuries they've been violating it by worshiping other gods, perpetrating injustice, oppressing the poor. And so, yes, God is slow to anger, but he eventually does get angry at human evil, and he will will bring his just anger in the form of punishment. In the case of Jerusalem, this involved allowing Babylon to come and conquer the city. And so this poem is acknowledging that God's wrath is justified, but this doesn't keep the poet from lamenting and asking God to show compassion once again. Chapter 3 breaks this design pattern by having three verses per letter, so it's the longest poem in the book. And the voice is that of a lonely man speaking out of his suffering and grief as a representative of the whole people. And what's interesting is that this chapter is full of language that's drawn from other parts parts of the Old Testament, from the laments of Job and from other important lament psalms and even from the suffering servant poems in Isaiah. And the poet sees his hardship as a form of God's justice, like chapter 2 said. But paradoxically, this is what gives the poet hope. And it leads him to offer the only hopeful words in the whole book. Because of the Lord's covenant faithfulness, we do not perish. His mercies never fail. They're new every morning. How great is your faithfulness, O God. So I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. So the poet reasons, if God is consistent enough to bring his justice on human evil, then he'll also be consistent with his covenant promise to not allow evil to get the final word. And so for this poet, God's judgment is the seedbed of hope for the future. Chapter 4 goes back to the same alphabet structure as chapters 1 and 2, and it's a vivid and disturbing depiction of the two-year siege in Jerusalem. And it contrasts how things used to be in Jerusalem of the past and how terrible they became in the siege. So children used to laugh and play in the streets, but now they beg for food. 
The wealthy used to eat lavish meals, but now they eat whatever they can find in the dirt. And the royal leaders used to be full of splendor, but now they're famished and dirty and unrecognizable. And the anointed king from the line of David has been captured and dragged away. So the poem's power comes from the shock of these contrasts, and it's exploring the depth of the suffering that Israel brought on itself. Now, the final poem is unique because it breaks the design pattern. It's the same length as all of the other alphabet poems, but the alphabet order is gone. It's like the poet can't hold it together anymore and his grief has exploded back into chaos. The poem is a communal prayer for God's mercy. Israel begs God not to ignore their suffering or abandon them. And the poem offers a long list of all of the different kinds of people who were devastated by the fall of the city. They ask God not to forget these people, and they lament on behalf of others, giving voice to their pain. Suffering in silence is just not a virtue in this book. God's people are not asked to deny their emotions, but voice their protest to vent their feelings and pour it all out before God. The book ends with something of a paradox. The poet acknowledges that God is the eternal king of the world, but also that Israel's circumstances make them feel like God is nowhere to be found. And so the final words of the book leave this tension totally unresolved. It asks, unless you've totally rejected us, and the book ends. The poet doesn't offer a nice, neat conclusion, much like our own experiences of pain and suffering. The story of the Bible doesn't end here, but this very important book shows us how lament and prayer and grief are a crucial part of the journey of faith of God's people in a broken world. And that's what the book of Lamentations is all about. You'll never hear a prosperity gospel preacher preaching through Lamentations. It doesn't fit the narrative, is I think the proper way to say it. And yet it's critical for us because, as was pointed out in the video, you have this, this tension that God's consistency in his character in judging gives you a foundation and a basis for hope of his consistency in showing mercy. And offering hope. So Lamentations, one writer said, is perhaps the saddest book of the Old Testament. Though some would say the authorship's anonymous, uh, there are many who say that it has the tone and the language that you find in Jeremiah. And so they believe the, that Jeremiah in grief writes looking back at the fall of Jerusalem. These Lamentations have been called five dirges of death. You may recall that Jesus chides the generation he lived in. He said, I, I, I played <clears throat> the, the harp for you and you wouldn't dance. I played the dirge and you wouldn't mourn. The idea of a, of a sad song. These five dirges of death. Uh, Jeremiah expresses horror and helplessness in seeing the Jews' proudest city, Jerusalem, reduced to rubble. It is marked by, by defeat, slaughter, ruination. These horrors he himself had prophesied, and yet to see them, to experience them, was almost more than he could bear. The Babylonians are the instrument God uses, but it is traced back to God's judgment. So his heart breaks. And yet in the midst of a broken heart, this is so critical for us as New Covenant believers, in the midst of brokenness, he expresses hope. There's a testimony of deep faith in the goodness and mercy of God. Even though his present is very bleak, he has confidence in the future. This is, it really reminds me when you read this of, of John Piper's book, entitled Future Grace, where you look forward to the future, not with fear, but with the confidence that because God has promised to be all for us, that we need him to be in Jesus Christ, that we will in the future yet 
taste and experience uh, vistas of his grace that right now we cannot imagine uh, the belief in future grace. And you see this in Jeremiah. And so this one of these great verses, we get to one of the great hymns is from this in chapter 3, verse 23. Great is your faithfulness. When you, get, when you take a survey of this, of, of the book, for 40 years, Jeremiah suffers rejection and abuse of his, for his warnings of coming judgment. Nebuchadnezzar finally comes in 586 B.C. and destroys Jerusalem. He destroys it in 586 B.C. Someone else might have said to the people, I told you so. I told you it was, this was going to happen. But that's not what you hear from Jeremiah. There's a compassion uh, and he identifies with the people, doesn't set himself apart from them. This tragic overthrow of Jerusalem. And so in, in expressing this, he is led by the Spirit to compose these, these five lamentations, these five uh, funeral dirges, because that's what the, what the picture is there. It's a, a lament, uh, is a poem for a funeral. And when you read these, though it's very sad, you pick up a tender heart in Jeremiah, whose mission was not an easy one. It's very much when, when we've read recently in Isaiah chapter 6, and Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And the Lord says, okay, go and tell this people this. They're going to they're gonna hear, but they will not listen. They're going to they're gonna see, but they will not understand or perceive. And, and Jeremiah, I mean, Isaiah's response is, how long will this be? And he talks about till the land is laid waste. And so Jeremiah had a very difficult task a, to take God's message to a sinful and stiff-necked people. When he's looking back, what he sees is that the city, the temple, the palace, and the walls have been reduced to rubble. And its inhabitants have either been slaughtered, taken captive to Babylon, or lost in intermarriage there in in their land. As I said, this takes place in, uh, in Jerusalem around 586 B.C. I want to show you the, the movements of the book and then we'll get, dig a little more into them. There is this destruction of Jerusalem in chapter 1, 1 through chapter 1, verse 22. Uh, there is, there's the city in mourning and grief, uh, the grief itself. And then in chapter 2, there's this anger of Jehovah acknowledged. Uh, chapter 2, verse one that should be chapter two, uh, the end of chapter two. The people are broken. Uh, the cause is their sin. They're turning their back on God. They're ignoring Him. Uh, I've, someone told me this morning after we were leaving the service that a child that they were sitting by, when we read our responsive reading out of Jeremiah six, where he said, "Stand in the way. Look at the old paths." And they said, "We will not stand. We will not go that way. We will not listen." And God says, well, here's what I will do in the light of that. And so these, these terrible pronouncements by God come as we're reading that. And this child looked up at this person and said, that's kind of harsh. And the response was, God's serious. God's serious. And so they have not taken God seriously. And you have this prayer for mercy in chapter 3, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 66. The prophet speaks of his suffering, but he also speaks of the hope. And then there's a reflection of looking back on the siege of Jerusalem and, and the details there, chapter 4, verse 1 to chapter 4, verse 22. Remember now, all four of these chapters are acrostics. They're, they're very much like, remember we told you in Psalm 119 when we looked at the Psalms, that every, uh, the stanzas in the Psalm 119 about the Word of God, uh, first stanza, uh, every line begins with Aleph, with the equivalent of our A, and the next one is Beit or our, our B, Gimel, our, our G, and you're going down that way. Well, that's what the, these are. These are 22 verses, chapters 1, 2, and 4, 22 verses, and they're written out with uh, the acrostic from the, from the alphabet, 22 letters of the alphabet. Chapter 4 is different. It's bigger because it's three verses in three verse segments where there's the Aleph, the Beit, the Gimel, the Daleth. And so... Uh, you have this, the repentance that is expressed by the prophet. And then there's in chapter 5, the prayer for rest, restoration, where there's a, there's a penitence expressed. So, in that first 
section, the destruction of Jerusalem. The city's been left desolate because of its sins. Uh, the enemies mocked Jerusalem uh, at her downfall. You see that in chapter 1, verse 7. Jerusalem pleads with God uh, to pay attention to her misery and then repay her enemies. It's very interesting. At one point in the, in the writings of the prophets, God talks about my servant. I'm sending my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> my servant. The wicked, pagan, Babylonian king is God's servant. Then he turns around and says, I will punish Nebuchadnezzar for uh, his, uh, his fiercity with which he dealt with my people, severity of it. And so they cry out to the Lord for that. The anger of Jehovah is highlighted in, in, the, uh, in the second lamentation to explain why. Babylon's destruction is, is, takes place in the hand of the Lord. And this is this is eyewitness account given in this of just how severe and total the devastation is. Think about this. When you're reading some of the Psalms, they talk about that we hung up our harps on the willows when they talk about captivity. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? When when the temple is destroyed, when all the religious uh, tools are destroyed. They, they do not know as a people, how do, we, how do we worship God when all of these things that are designed to assist us in the worship of God, help us to focus in the worship of God, how do we do that? And then when they're carried off into captivity, how do we worship the Lord in a foreign land among pagans? And it was a real, it was a real dilemma for them. The priests and the prophets and the kings are taken away. And Jeremiah grieves. When you get to chapter 3, this prayer for mercy, this, uh, the longer chapter, these first 18 verses, uh, he appeals to the Lord in terms of the miseries and the despair of the people. And he talks about them being his own misery and despair. And in chapter 3, verses 19 to 39, he begins to speak about the faithfulness of God. And brothers and sisters, this, this is a book to study if you want to learn how do we relate to God in the times of great trial? How do we relate to God in times when it seems like everything that, that was certain was devastated? And you come back to who God is, and that's what, that's what he does. He speaks of God's faithfulness, of the love of God. That's called the steadfast love of God. The compassion of God, when you look at the history of God to Israel, his compassion. I would just simply say at this point, as you're pressing through the difficult times, find yourself there, you, you remember his past mercies. You cling to the promises that, are, that were true then and are present and true for you today. And then you anticipate the future manifestations of his faithfulness and his goodness and his grace. And that's... That's how you make it through that. So Jeremiah is able to find comfort and hope in the midst of judgment. He does so. It's not a flippant thing for him, though. It's very deep sorrow. And then the fourth chapter is about the siege of Jerusalem where he, where he rehearses, really, as it were, what, what he saw happen. The suffering, the starvation. Of both rich and poor, didn't matter. And remembers that it was the sins of the prophets and the priests and their refusal to trust in God and their insistence in trusting on human aid. And it ends with a warning of future punishment for Edom and a, and a hope of future mercy for Jerusalem. And then the last movement, the last lamentation, chapter 5. It's a kind of a description of his state. The punishment is complete. Jeremiah aches for God to restore what he has destroyed. As I said a while ago, the term lamentations is a 
It's a word that describes the funeral of a city. It kind of reflects as, as, as Jerusalem is personified here on a once proud Jerusalem now reduced to rubble by the Babylonian hordes. A death has occurred. Jerusalem lies devastated. This title for the book comes from the first words of, of chapters 1, 2, and 4. It's a, uh, the Hebrew title. The word is in Hebrew, akah. And, the, and the, the, the expression is, ah, how? Ah, how? There's another Hebrew word, genoth, which literally means lamentations. The Greek title is the word thranoi, which means dirges or laments. And then the Latin title, thrani, is tears or lamentations. So this is how the, how the, the book develops its, its name finally. It's the book of laments. Though the author is unnamed, the evidence, internal evidence, and by that I mean when the, when the uh, textual scholars who spend their entire lives dedicated to looking at, the, at how words are used, how phrases are used, what the vocabulary is in a book, the internal textual evidence gives uh, credence in favor of Jeremiah. Now, there's pretty much consensus well, with a notable exception on our video, that Jeremiah, this would be the external evidence. In the Septuagint, the Greek version, <clears throat> you read this about the book. It came to pass after Israel had been carried away captive and Jerusalem had become desolate that Jeremiah sat weeping and lamented with this lamentation over Jerusalem, saying, and that's how the, how the uh, Greek version of the Old Testament introduces the book. You find this same kind of thing in the Talmud, uh, in the, uh, the Aramaic Targum, uh, and early Christian writers like uh, Origen and Jerome. Let's look real quickly. I don't have this on the, on the screen, I don't think, but Second, Second Chronicles. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 35. Twenty-five, which speaks of uh, Jeremiah, also uttered a lament for Josiah, and all the singing men and singing women have spoken of Josiah and their laments to this day. They made these a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. And it's talking about the Book of Lamentations here, in the laments. And so you have. Uh, internal and external something that Jeremiah certainly would have been familiar with the tone that we find in the book of Jeremiah we find in the book of Lamentations then there's about the date and the setting it's written soon after Jerusalem's destruction I think I said earlier Jeremiah is written about the coming destruction, and you find yourself in the midst of it. This is, this is written looking back and as the exile is beginning. To give you a time frame reminder, Nebuchadnezzar had laid siege to Jerusalem uh, from January 588 B.C. until July 586 B.C. It fell on July 19th. The city and temple were burned August 15th. And one writer that I read says that Jeremiah probably wrote these five laments before he was taken captive to Egypt by his disobedient countrymen not long after the destruction. So, so somewhere right in there, 
after it had fallen. When you look, talk about theme and purpose of this. This is uh, it's tricky because there are five poems uh, in a movement here. And so it's been suggested, and I'll put these up for you here, uh, that the most prominent theme is that of, of grieving or mourning over Jerusalem's holocaust, and that's what they experienced. It's a true holocaust, devastation uh, upon everything that they'd held near and dear, and then being carted off uh, to a foreign land, to Babylon. The second theme uh, is a confession of sin, an acknowledgement of God's righteous and holy judgment upon Judah. While it's tragic, while it's devastating, God was right to do it. It was his righteousness that unfolded. And the third theme uh, is this note of hope that God will in the future restore his people. He's poured out his wrath, but his mercy, in mercy he will be faithful to his covenant promises. And that's where that, uh, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. It was, utter, it was devastation, it was incredible devastation, but not utter devastation so as to wipe these people off the planet. God did that to some nations in the Old Testament. The various litany of nations you go through from time to time. His mercies are not, because of his mercies were not consumed. His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Well, what about the keys to lamentations? Well, the key word, of course, is, is that of lament, sadness, sorrow, grief. The key verses we looked at earlier, we're going to look at these again real quickly. Lamentations 2, 5, and 6. Now, this is interesting when you think about what Jeremiah had to come to, what he had to be taught by the Lord to come to this. Because when you're looking, what you see is the, is the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. And he says, the Lord has become like an enemy. He doesn't say the Lord's become our enemy. He's become like an enemy. He swallowed up Israel. Swallowed up all its palaces, everything that would, would make Israel look majestic. He's laid in ruins its stronghold. He is multiplied in the daughter of Judah, mourning and lamentation. The Lord has done this, he says. He's laid waste his booth like a garden, this picture of, of where you would gather with him. Laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath. Who would... In, in the face of all that devastation, who would be preparing, making preparation for a festival? Who would be thinking about Sabbath preparation? It's gone. And in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. Those that he set over the people, he has now rejected them, taken no regard for them. They would be treated to the same fate of the common people. That's a very sober, uh, it's interesting, when you, when you read this and you hear these people today who get, get some sort of voice in the press and some, some tragedy befalls and they say, well, you know, God wasn't in this. And if you, if you read some of the comments in the aftermath of the, of the shooting at the church in Texas, you know, where was God? Clearly, he was no help to them. They were, they were in his house, so-called, and they were praying. He didn't hear their prayers. Where is this? The, the, the way people talk about this, even so-called friends of the faith trying to get, God doesn't have anything to do with this. That's not the attitude taken in the Bible, folks. They see God as sovereign over all, and they don't try to get God off the hook in crisis and in tragedy. Jeremiah faces it straight on, but that's not the final word he has. Lamentation 3, Lamentation 3 22 to 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Now, you see, for us, the way we think, it would be, well, it's either or. Either, either God shows steadfast love, and if he does, then these terrible things can't happen. And that's not the way to think biblically. God is perfectly within his right, his holy justice, 
to bring devastation upon disobedience and wickedness. And it doesn't and should not smear or besmirch or call into question his steadfast love, his, his loving kindness, his, his, his chesed, this love that the picture there is of the love that it, you find in the womb of a woman for a child. Those two are not mutually exclusive. God is holy. So every manifestation of every attribute is like turning a diamond. It's the one holy God who reflects in these various facets his character. They never come to an end. His mercies endure forever, the psalmist would say. They're new every morning. This, this, this level of devastation to Jerusalem may be new to us. But God's mercies are new every morning. We'll, we'll wake up. The, the song from the, from the uh, Broadway musical Annie, the sun will come out tomorrow. You know, that's, a, that's a kind of a silly way to say it, but God's mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness because his mercies are tied to his faithfulness. He's not fickle. He doesn't throw temper tantrums. That's not what, what happened in Jerusalem. This was a, this was a warned forecast, divinely instigated with holy purposes and motives, expression of holy justice upon a people who had spurned him over and over. Of course, the key chapter, wouldn't surprise you, is chapter 3, uh, because that's, the t that's where the tone turns. It goes from, from the, the utter hopelessness to faith in God's goodness. Well, where do, where do we see Jesus in Lamentations? Well, you probably know the, the, uh, the weeping prophet Jeremiah who grieves over Jerusalem is a type of Christ. It should remind us very much, if you want to look at, at Matthew 23, 37, and 38, six centuries later, our Savior would stand outside looking over Jerusalem and say this, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Now, if you know your history, you know that in 70 A.D., not the Babylonians, but the Roman legions of Antiochus Epiphanes came and leveled Jerusalem again. Destroyed it. Burned it. And Jesus is speaking there of how they have turned again. You would, they would not show a willingness to be gathered unto the Lord's Messiah. And they have doomed themselves. And just as it was desolate 600 years before, it would be desolate again in about 40 years. Also, just as Jeremiah identifies himself personally uh, with the plight of Jerusalem and with human suffering, our Savior did the same. In the Incarnation, God comes. Paul says in Philippians that, that he, he emptied himself of his divine prerogatives. Did not think his equality with God something to be clasped onto, but made himself of no reputation, taking upon himself the form of a servant and being found in, in the likeness and fashion of a man. Humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even death of a cross. The incarnation is about Jesus, the Son of God, identifying with the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. To become one of us, one among us, fully God, fully man, so that he might suffer in our place. Jeremiah, as a weeping prophet, feels with empathy what the people have experienced because he himself has experienced. And so he is a, he's a type of Christ. You see Jesus in that. And then we'll see just real quickly here that 
that it also includes elements that typify the life and ministry of this man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Look with me at these verses here. He was afflicted. Look at Lamentations 1, 12. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Jeremiah is not saying there, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. He's saying, I'm not distant from this. Yes, I, I predicted this. I warned about this. But I, too, have suffered as much as you have suffered. And then Lamentations 3.19. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. And he is speaking here personally and experientially, but he is speaking prophetically about what uh, our Savior would speak to 600 years later. Not only was he afflicted, he was despised and derided by his enemies. Look at Lamentations 2, 15 and 16. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? All your enemies rail against you. They hiss. They gnash their teeth. They cry, we've swallowed her. Ah, this is the day we longed for. Now we have it. We see it. The scoffing of the enemies of the Jews. And their Savior, 600 years later, would be mocked. He saved himself. He saved, he saved others. Could he not save himself? Call on Elijah to come and save you. The mocking that took place. And then Lamentations 3.14. I've become the laughing stock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. And then chapter 3, verse 30. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with insults. You've got to see in this what Jeremiah is speaking about sometimes for himself, sometimes for the people, the daughter, foreshadows and anticipates what our Savior would go through. So in Jeremiah, this, this book of the weeping prophet, this book of lamentations, this, this book of sadness, this book of, of funeral language that captures our Savior, who was a man of sorrow according to to Isaiah 53 and acquainted, too much acquainted with grief. Well, what's its contribution to the, to the Bible? That's a question we often ask. Well, I've told you the structure of it is, is a fascinating uh, piece of poetic genius. Five chapters, five poems of lament, one, two, three, and one, two, and four, 22 verses, chapter 3, 66 verses, three verses each of the, of the Hebrew alphabet. And then chapter 5, and I like the way our video describes it. It's as if, as if he could, the writer could hold it together no longer. And rather than this, this ordered, amazingly ingenious way of communicating things through acrostic, he just, he doesn't bother with the acrostic. He just spills out his heart almost in chaos. So you have this, this contribution, uh, which puts it in some of the zenith of literature. One of the writings that I read said, the Jews publicly read this vivid and tragic book each year to commemorate Jerusalem's destruction in 586 BC and again in 70 AD. In the Hebrew Bible, it was placed in the Megilloth, which, is the, which means the five scrolls, along with the Song of Solomon, Ruth, Esther, Ecclesiastes. But in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it follows Jeremiah, as it does in, in the English versions. So Jeremiah anticipates the fall, Lamentations reflects back upon it. With grief, with an understanding of why it happened, and with the hope that God was not finished 
with his people. There would yet be a day when they would have reason to hope again in God's mercy and goodness as it would manifest itself among them, which it certainly did 600 years later when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And that's a summary of Lamentations. Questions, comments, observations on that?